Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name, as has already been mentioned, is Nigel Robinson. I'm the Chief Financial Officer of Central Asia Metals, PLC. So what is it that we, uh, we do? We're a copper producing company based in Kazakhstan that listed on the alternative investment market in September 2010, where we raised $60 million to develop our project in Kazakhstan. Our production, and I'll come on to the production later, is from a process known as leaching, and then we do solvent extraction, electro-winning to produce pure cathode copper. We have a what's known in the industry as a jort resource, which means it's compliant with ver various geological standards, and we have approximately 250,000 tonnes of recoverable copper at the resource itself. What makes us unique in the uh, mining game is that we're very low cost, and I'll come on to the cost later. We're well in the lowest quartile of the cost curve, which is important if you want to stay competitive when metal prices are completely outside of your control and you have to take the price, so you have to make sure that you ensure that you produce at the lowest possible cost. We have cash in the bank at the moment in Treasury at the year end, and these results are 31st December 2016 numbers. We had $40.4 million of cash and no debt having raised $60 million, as I said before, about six and a half years ago on an IPO and having built the plant as well. Um, I'll come on to the Western dumps and business expansion uh, later on in the presentation. Um, but the key numbers on the right-hand side of the diagram, you can see there, we had a record year last year, 14,020 tonnes of cathode copper produced at 43 cents per pound. And for those of you not in, in the copper industry, effectively, copper today was selling at about $2.56. So you can see there's a healthy margin between what it costs us to produce it and what we physically sell it for. Last year, we had a, uh, an EBITDA of $39.1 million. Uh, and the thing really which, again, makes us fairly unique in the mining game is that we pay a healthy dividend. We pay dividends back to shareholders. We have done for several years now. And last year, our dividend was about 50, well, was, wasn't about, it was 15.5 pence, which was a yield on the current share price today of about £2.20, of something like about 65 to 7%. Just a couple of charts that show our share price performance since we listed six and a half years ago. As you can see, we've uh, basically beaten the trend. There's the copper price since we listed in September 2010, unfortunately has gone against us in many ways, reaching a peak of about $10,000 per tonne, coming down to today's price, which is more or less stabilised, and a lot of analysts are saying that it'll increase over the next few years. But there's our share price from listing 96 pence, slowly increasing as we announced our dividend policy and delivered on our promises effectively. We have a market cap of near £250 million now, and our total shareholder return, now what that is, is effectively the capital growth you get from the 96 pence IPO through to £2.20, which is today's share price approximately, plus the value of all the dividends we've paid back is about 192% total shareholder return. That's the uh, dividends we've paid back to shareholders since we listed. Uh, we started production in 2012, and in December 2012, we announced a dividend policy and our dividend policy is fairly unique as well. It's based on our revenue, our gross revenue that we earn from the copper sales. And what we've said to our shareholders is that we will pay them back a minimum of 20% of the gross revenue earned from our Kunrad project. Historically though, and since we started production over five years ago now, we've given back close to 31% of that revenue to the shareholders, which is a pretty good number. And tomorrow we'll pay our final dividend for 2016 of $14 million or 10 pence per share. Just a few statistics, a bit of history about the, uh, the asset that we own in Kazakhstan. Um, I won't bore you with all the facts and figures, but what you can see on there is an aerial photograph that shows the size of the open pit. We don't mine the open pit as such. What we process is the material which is just to the left of it here and to the southwest, the dumps. Mineralized material that was taken out of the ground and at the time couldn't be processed by the Soviet miners going back to 1936 when they started the mine. There's about 2.9 million tonnes of copper were produced in the open pit by the Soviets. And as I say, what we're doing is processing what they class as waste, but mineralised material that couldn't be processed at the time. And we estimate there's about 650 million tonnes of waste in those surface dumps there. 
different heights and different uh, mineralogy, and we are managing that process of extracting the copper from them. What I'm going to show you now is a short video which will only takes two minutes and it'll show you the size and scale of the operations that we manage out there. Unfortunately, there is no sound to it, there is no music or anything, I'm certainly not going to sing, but I'll try and point out some of the key, key aspects as we go through it. So as you can see, here's an aerial view that we've just seen, the open pit with the dumps to the left and the right, and there you can see the plant, the SXEW plant that we've developed from the money we raised at IPO. This plant here initially cost $39 million to build, and then we did an expansion of another approximately $15 million, and it can produce up to 14,000 tonnes of cathode copper by a process known as electrolysis. You can see the railway sidings we put in place to actually transport the copper back out to customers and also bring in reagents. Leaching operations, all of our copper so far has been produced from the east here that you can see. And what we do is we put highly diluted sulfuric acid onto the dumps, which picks up copper as it goes through the dumps, which we process then in the plant. Our focus last year was very much on extending the life of the operation by going out to the western dumps, which contains almost twice as much material as the eastern dumps, about 175,000 tonnes of contained copper. And here's just some aerial view of the size and scale, 45 metres high some of these dumps, and you can see the infrastructure that we've put in place, uh, which was our focus last year on our last major capital programme really to develop the project. We started leaching the blocks in April of this year. Same process as in the east, and 10 days later, the leachate solution, which is what we call pregnant leach solution, was coming out of the dumps. That's PLS, and it basically contains small amounts of copper, two, three, four grams per litre of copper, which we will then ship round to the plant at the east to produce our copper. And in those five years, 60 months, we produced 60,000 tonnes of copper. And I think what that shows you is the reliability of the plant and high level of availability of the plant, which works 24 hours a day and 365 days a year. So hopefully that gives you a feel for, for what we do. In terms of our production uh, over the past few years since we started, what this chart shows you is the seasonality. Kazakhstan can get extremely cold in the winter and it also gets extremely warm in the summer. And what we tend to do is produce more copper in the summer months, in Q2 and Q3, for example, than we do in the winter months. But we do still produce in the winter months. We always produce. We have boilers on site which heat the solution that we put onto the dumps, so we're continually uh, processing copper throughout the year. I've already mentioned last year was a record year. 14,000 tonnes, which was 16% up on the previous year. And you can see the general trend of growth. Each year we've developed, sorry, we've produced more and more copper by incremental improvements on what we do and also by the expansion programmes we've put in place. The outlook for this year is 13 to 14,000 tonnes of copper. That was our outlook for last year. And really, this, this growth of output each year will now tail off. And what we expect is for the next 15 years, as we've developed the West, 15 and plus years, we'll be, we'll be producing up to 14,000 tonnes of cathode copper from the project. Just moving on to the various areas, what this slide is really showing is a diagrammatic plan view of the eastern dumps. That's where all the production has come from so far. And as I mentioned before, we, we've got 100, we expected to have in situ 167,000 tonnes of copper. We won't recover all of that copper. And in the east, which is what's known as an oxide resource, we expected we recover on average about between 45 and 50% of copper. As you can see from the column in the middle there, what we've actually produced, and this is to the end of December by the way, was close to 55,000 tonnes of copper. And we expect that in this area, primarily dump five and dump two, we'll produce over the next two and a half, three years, another 25,000 tonnes of cathode copper from exactly the same process. Looking to the west, which is where we put our efforts in last year, what we're focusing on now, and it's a huge area, it's almost twice, you can see, you can visually see that it's almost twice the area in terms of footprint. And what we're focusing on and what you saw in the video is this area here, the, what we call the initial leaching area. Slightly different leaching characteristics, but a bigger area, as I say, with twice as much copper, we're planning on lower recoveries, between 35 to 42% recoveries, as opposed to the 45 to 50 we had in the east. But 
None of that matters to us because what we're bothered about is getting the cathode copper out. As long as we can get the solution and the volumes flowing from the, from the leaching operations into the plant with sufficient copper to produce 50 tonnes a day or whatever, we'll produce our target of 13 to 14,000 tonnes of copper. And what this will do, this will extend the life of mine way out to beyond 2030. Coming on to the costs, um, I guess this is absolutely vital to the success of the project in many ways. We produce copper at extremely low cost. As I said before, $2.56 is the price of copper today, and that's quite low by historical standards. And yet we produce it at what we class as a C1 co cash cost up here. That includes all the costs of production of physically producing the copper in the plant, all the costs of actually getting it out to the, the, the end customer, if you like, which is a Turkish wine manufacturer, and then local GNA cost. Combined, that's 43 cents. And if you look on the industry cash cost curve, and this is what you need to do in the mining game, is make sure you're right down at the bottom here, so you're competitive at whatever the price of copper is. And we're one of the world's lowest cost copper producers because we don't move any of the ore. We, we, we leach in situ, so there's no cost of big, big mining equipment, etc. We leach in situ, so we take away a lot of the cost. And the, the other thing to note about this slide is that even on a fully inclusive basis, because we at the moment only have one project, we're still competitive by a lot of other mining companies. $1.06 down from $1.58 the previous year, and $1.06 for a lot of big companies is, is quite competitive, even at a C1 level. So, so that's, that's, that's useful to know. You will see a marked deduction between 2015 and 2016. I can't stand here and pretend that was all because of good management. We like to think a lot of it was good management, but there was a large devaluation in the Kazakh Tenge between year and year, which affected our cost base and actually was a positive influence on our cost base. What this slide shows is a consistency of performance, I guess, since we switched the lights on at the plant. What you've seen is a increase year on year of production and sales, despite a declining copper price on average that we've been able to achieve in the marketplace. But we've managed to keep healthy revenues generating extremely good EBITDA margins. An average over the period of 56 months of 59% EBITDA margin. And the total EBITDA over that period of over $200 million. And importantly, what we do with that money is two, two key areas. Obviously, we've expanded the plant and we've spent money on CapEx to develop the project. But we pay a lot of money locally in taxes. We pay our taxes like a good citizen. We've paid close to $82 million in tax. And the balance really goes back to shareholders. Whilst we've nothing better to do with the money and we've got a pact with our shareholders, we, we pay it back on the dividend policy that we announced in 2012. And you can see nearly $96 million paid back. And you can see the consistency of the low cost operation and that big jump there year on year from 60 to 43, primarily as a consequence of devaluation. Capital, what this slide's showing is how much capital we've invested in that project that you saw on the, on the uh, video there. $74 million. We've had a couple of expansion programs. The initial plant was $39 million. First stage expansion took us from a 10,000 ton output to a 15,000 ton nominal output. That was another $15 million. And then the stage two was what I showed you before in terms of extending the life of the mine and allowing us to operate beyond 2030. And the, the license expires in 2034. So that's a total of $74 million with what we class as sustaining capital. And the key there is that over those past five years as we develop the project, we've still been paying good dividends back to shareholders. As we progress into the future, we've got a program of probably only two to $3 million at most going out on capital. So there's additional cash to either give back to shareholders or to invest in the business and other growth opportunities. Very important in the mining game, social or corporate and social responsibility. We take our health and safety responsibilities extremely seriously. We now have a, a very good record on site, not that we never did have, should I say, but we have a very good record on site of over 1.5 million man hours, LT free man hours, which is lost time, injury free time man hours effectively. I, we've worked that many man hours on site without having an incident that's caused somebody to be off sick and therefore lose some production. And we have regular health and safety inspections. And as I say, we, we do take this extremely safe seriously, as we do the environment. Um, we have got good ground conditions for the leaching conditions and the leaching operations that we, we perform on site. But what we do is make sure that we check back through a series of boreholes 
outside the collector trench to make sure there's no leakages and that we are looking, you know, to make sure that everything is, is satisfactory with the leaching operation and that there's no leakage into uh, groundwater or whatever. And then socially, uh, I've already mentioned how much money we pay in taxes. Most of the staff are recruited locally. We only have one expat on site. Uh, we have a loyal workforce. We pay them well. When the devaluation happened, we paid our staff 25% pay increase to, to assist them effectively because they were the guys who were suffering on the ground. And I think that, you know, that generates loyalty amongst the staff back towards the management team, really. They're the guys who produce this copper at low cost in fairly arduous conditions. And locally with the community, we work hard to develop relationships with them in terms of building schools, sorry, painting schools and doing various bits of work that we can to help out as and when. Because it's a pretty deprived area, all in all, from when the original mining operations pulled out of the area. So that, that's Coonrad, and that's our main project. That's what we've been growing for the past five years since we listed on, on AIM. Uh, and that's really X growth now. So that will continue to deliver the 14,000 tonnes of copper per annum, low cost, and a very good project to have in our portfolio. But what we do have to do is look for growth. We can be very patient about it. We've got money in the bank. We don't have to rush into it. But one project we picked up last year, at the back end of last year, was a project called Shuak. Um, it's earlier stage exploration than maybe we would have liked, but it's got very, uh, very prospective geological um, output, which is Soviet, um, Soviet stated, what you say there, pre, pre uh, GKZ resource of 327,000 tonnes of contained copper at a 0.66% grade, which is very good actually. Um, but the problem is it's a Soviet resource. So what we have to do is prove up that resource through our own drilling program. So we won't be seeing physical copper coming out of this project for another four to five years. But it is exciting. It's a big area. And the prospective area we're really looking at is the um, potentially to do an open pit on the surface, on the oxide copper at the surface. But we may have something slightly bigger than that. But at the moment, we don't know. We'll do some drilling this year. And this was for an investment really with the partners that we've uh, teamed up with in Kazakhstan of just $2 million. We've got a program for $1.3 million to spend on drilling this year. So we'll certainly spend that money uh, and then see what the results give us and, and take the project from there. But this is quite exciting. We took some analysts out about five or six weeks ago and several of them were geologists who got extremely excited by the colour of the rocks, which is you know, a good, good sign in many, many respects. And then overall business development. We have that project now. We have been looking, we have a business development director who manages that process. We look far and wide, different geographies, um, different metals, but primarily focusing on copper um, and different sizes of projects. It may be companies, maybe assets, maybe just be a, be a mine that we're looking at. Um, as yet, we've not landed on anything, but we continue to look uh, and we're hopeful that in the future we'll, we'll actually find something that we can invest in. One of the problems we have is that Coonrad is so successful and such a good return on Coonrad is that we don't really want to be measured by that because it would be extremely difficult to find another Coonrad out there. So we have to temper those expectations as best we can. What about coverage on the markets? Uh, very good coverage. You can see the names up there. You'll recognise a few of those, I should imagine. Canaccord, Fincap, Mirabeau, uh, Investec, Peel Hunt. In fact, Mirabeau and Investec, sorry, Mirabeau and Peel Hunt are our in-house brokers. Um, Peel Hunt being our nomad. And on the right-hand side, you can see there are shareholder base. Again, some very good names on there. Hargreave Hale, Majady, Fidelity, BlackRock, Myton. So good coverage, good shareholder base, and they've been loyal shareholders for six years now. Some of them have come in and come out, depending on what view they have on copper. Um, but, the, you know, what we're proud of is the fact that some of them have been out. Fidelity, for example, and then got back in when they took a different view on copper. So, so it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a good story, it's a positive story, and one that we're particularly proud of. All of those analysts as well have a buy recommendation out on us. So, so I must just state that at the point. And if you wanted to read the Martin & Co. Uh, independent research notes on us, it is on our website if you wanted to go to that and have a look at it. Just to sum up then with a couple of minutes left, um, we're a profitable business. We're in copper in Kazakhstan. Uh, we have strong EBITDA margins and a low uh, C1 cash cost of operations which enables that strong margin. Uh, strong balance sheet, we have no debt. We've got cash in the bank, $40.4 million. Um, and we have healthy cash flows, as I've already mentioned, from a, from a project that's fully developed. I mean, we've developed that and we know how it operates. We know the cost base. Um, and so we, we don't expect any additional big capital expenditure programs at Coonrad. So what we're really looking for is the next project that'll grow from that base. Um, therefore, we're you know, pretty well placed for growth opportunities in the mining game. 
And the final point I'll end on, because it says one minute in red here, is just to reiterate our dividends. 15.5 pence for 2016, which is a yield of about 6.5 pence, 6.5 percent, should I say, and a unique policy that gives money back based on the revenue that we generate from our Conrad operation of a minimum 20 percent, but 30 percent has been paid back. And $96 million paid back today out of an investment or a raising, should I say, on an IPO six years ago of $60 million is a, is a pretty healthy story. And on that point, uh, I'll stop and open the floor for any questions. Super. Thank you very much indeed, Nigel. Do we have any questions, please? Well, again, uh, oh, here we are, David, thank you. <coughs> I wanted to ask about your, uh, your customer base, um, mm -hmm. and if you could expand a little bit on that, please. <coughs> yeah, customer base is quite easy, actually. What a lot of mining companies do, they, they engage with a partner called an off-take partner. So we use a company called Traxxas. So all our copper, well, 90% of it contractually, is committed to them for the next year and a half now through to the end of December 2018. In many ways, we're not bothered where they sell it to. I mean, that's, that's, that's a bit trite of me to say because they, if it's not our responsibility. They buy it off and they have a contractual commitment to buy it at the LME prices, quotation periods and different things. So, but they actually at the moment, and have done since we started the, op the operation, they've always sold it out to Turkey, to a, a wine manufacturer in Turkey, which in itself actually shows you the quality of the product because you don't sell copper cathode to wine manufacturers unless it's high quality five nines copper. So, so that, that's a good, you know... Um, a good sign that the copper's, copper's very good. But if, if they stop taking that copper, it would really be Trax's responsibility to decide where to ship the copper elsewhere. We probably work with them and we like to know where it is going, but, but that, is, you know, that, that is the customer base uh, in a nutshell. It's not like we have lots of customers out there that we need to worry about debtors and where's the cash coming from and have they not paid the bad debtor. Really, it's, it's quite a straightforward working capital process in that sense. Um, I guess because the company has been so successful in achieving what it set out to at the start, mm -hmm. um, and it's, without being rude, it's quite a simple story in many ways, um, it, it, it's one that maybe there aren't a huge amount of questions on what you're currently doing, what you've done, because that's quite well established. I think the questions are around what's next to the company. And you talked about the exploration um, uh, project. Mm -hmm. I think I'm right in also saying you've got a Copper Bay. Um, mm -hmm. is, that, is that going anywhere, Copper Bay, or is that... On the, on the back burner, or is that um, a Well, the first thing is, yeah, we, I didn't mention Copper Bay. Firstly, we're excited about Shuak. It shows good prospects, and we're excited to develop that. Copper Bay is a project in Chile. Uh, it's a tailings project on the beach, which we've invested $6 million in so far to get a 75% stake. We developed it in December, through to December to what's known as a definitive feasibility study stage. Uh, and effectively, the copper price at the time, it, which we needed really $3 per pound to be an incentive, incentivization price, really, to get the kind of returns we'd need, we decided it wasn't worth progressing. But we had money still left from that $6 million initial investment, which we've used over the past few months to actually work on a few aspects of it, see if we can enhance the economic returns and enhance the understanding of the engineering and what's required to actually develop that project. But it is a far more difficult project than Cunard. As you say, mm. one thing that is good about Cunard, it's a simple project in many ways. I mean, that's, that's easy as an accountant to say here in London, isn't it? There's a lot yeah. of hard work goes in the background to make it work. But Copper Bay is slightly more difficult. It's dredging, it's then materials handling, it's flotation, it's SXEW. So there's a lot of components that from an engineering perspective make it more risky. So as a cautious management team, we are cautious about moving that further at this stage, really. But we are working in the background on it. And on the, um, on the SHUAC project, um, and obviously you've got a very able team delivering on the, on the Coon Red, but I, I would imagine that the skills required or the expertise required to be an explorer or a developer might be quite different. And it, 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 do you feel... Um, you need to bring more people in or, or other partners no, or, 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 or it's something you want to take on and, and do Because it stands a big country, it's, yeah. so it's not next door to Coonra, but it's in the same backyard kind of thing. It's actually, I don't know, probably about a thousand miles or something between <laughs> the two projects. But the geologists we employed are very good geologists on the Kunrad project, so probably a little bit, they've got time on their hands effectively now because it's developed. So yeah. we're using those, those geologists. I'm bringing in you know, Western geologists as and when we need them on the Shuak project. So in that sense, I think we've got the skill set we need to develop it to you know, is there a good resource there that we can put a study onto and then we'll use external resources as, as and when we need to. So I'm sure we've got the skill set to develop it. And if we find that SHUAC lends itself to an open pit operation with an oxide, you know, copper, open pit oxide copper, which needs an SXEW plant, we've got the expertise <laughs> in Kazakhstan to do that. Absolutely. Um, so, so we're pretty confident that we could do it if what we think is there is there. Yeah. Okay. 
Any questions, please? Turn to the back. You benefited from the devaluation of the tenki. Mm -hmm. What's the possibility it goes the other way? <laughs> That's a very good question, actually, yeah. Um, just to put it into numbers, it went in August 2015 from a rate of 185 tenge to the dollar almost overnight to north of 300. It went to 365 at one stage and then stabilised about 340. Um, I cannot stand here and say it never will, but the, the Kazakh economy is linked into oil prices and the Russian economy in many ways. Uh, and obviously oil prices have improved a little bit and it has strengthened on the basis of that. So it's come down this year, I think the average is about 320 tenge to two dollars. So there's still a big margin for us to benefit from, but you're right, I mean it would erode slowly into some of our cost base. But we don't expect, and certainly talking to people who know the Kazakh economy better than we do, uh, they don't expect it to go south of 300 in the short term, that's for sure. Um, and there hasn't been massive inflation either, so we've benefited from that point. We did expect there'd be far higher levels of inflation, but on the, if you like, the ingredients we put into the plant, there's not been high levels of inflation. In fact, the c costs have been kept quite well under control. There's been fairly high levels of inflation of like, imp imported food goods and things like that for some of the people, which is why we gave the 25% pay rise to the staff to help them out, really. Um, and it's a bit of a mixed story, I have to say, but on the whole, you know, it's, it's a good question. If it went back down to 185, we'd reverse, but we would still be a low cost operation. Even at 60 cents per pound, we were still in that lowest quartile, lowest decile. So, you know, it wouldn't be as good a story, but it'd still be a good story. And um, could you tell me, on the plans you showed of the Coonrad um, uh, project, the, the new development in the west, mm. how you transport the material to the processing plant in the east. Is, is there some sort of pumping system or, or yeah, how does so, that work? Well, they, you, you see there's one of the pumps that pumps it, pumps it around, but just to show it in diagrammatic... Sorry, I'm going to counter that. I don't know what I'm doing with this bloody thing. Yeah. Um, we'll get there shortly. Yeah, so those dashed lines, I didn't have time on the video to actually yeah. talk to it really, but what, what you've got there effectively is there's the plant to the southeast where the eastern operates where we started the initial leaching and what we what we debated was do we build another plant down here mm. um, but this plant it, it's it's very robust as you saw from the numbers there you know as long as we look after it maintain it that plant will last another 15 20 years so if we'd done that this would have become obsolete in two or three years because all the, all the all the material to feed the plant would have would have been used up effectively on a commercial level based on what we're planning so what we decided to do was was build these two 12 kilometer pipelines one takes what's known as the raffinate, which is a highly diluted sulfuric acid over here and puts it on the dumps and leaches it in the same way we leach there. And as it comes off into the collector trenches, there's another pipeline here, another 12 kilometre pipeline, just pumps it back to the plant. So we're really just doing exactly the same leaching process here yeah. and shipping it through these. The other thing we've put in place as part of the infrastructure at a cost of about $1.4 million was a pipeline down, there's a big lake down, down here. <laughs> called Balkas Lake, and that's to get more water supply, basically. We've got adequate water now. We just we were probably going to get a little bit tight on water in four years' time from the source we started off with. So we put a pipeline for water, and we feel we've developed all the infrastructure we need to use this to, to, to uh, process copper from this project for the next, as I say, 15-plus years beyond 2030. Super. Um, any other final questions, please, for Nigel? I think we're there. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Did, did you sorry, did you bump? Oh, sorry. So sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Except my apologies. Um, on the on the cost base, can you give me a rough idea of how it breaks down between the various elements on a? Uh, I'm talking operating cost uh, primarily. Yeah, if I just go back, uh, well, I hope this this slide helps. This one here. Um, in many ways, that level it's not quite true is an EBITDA level. And it's before interest tax, depreciation, amortisation. So that C1 cash cost has got all the costs of labour, electricity, all the reagents in the plant, all the costs of physically producing the copper, plus the administration costs in Kazakhstan, plus the distribution costs of shipping it out to the customer. So, you know, that's, that's basically the unit, unit cost we've got. And can you give me a, a rough split of that? In terms of labour well, yeah, versus transportation? Of that 43, that and it's pretty rough, I'd say it's almost 25% each. There's okay. electricity is maybe nine cents per pound, and then there's reagents probably another nine or ten cents per pound. Labour will be something similar to that, and then there's yeah. other site yeah. costs. Okay. We have got another presentation. If you go on the website, you might see that, but it's got a breakdown of that C1 cash cost. 
we do it for all the analysts, which is you know payroll, labour, sorry, payroll and labour, electricity, reagents, and other site costs. So, right. right. And there's no one big portion of that that, if it blew out for any reason, if there was high inflation, would would throw those cash costs out of kilter. They're, they're, they're all pretty well controlled. I mean, electricity is a good example. It's we we pay four cents per kilowatt hour. In, in Kazakhstan for electricity. So well, that was going to be my next question, actually. How self-sufficient are you in terms of utilities? You've mentioned you need to extract water from the lake. Yeah, pretty, pretty uh, good. You're, are you buying in all your power, or do you have generation We're buying power from the, from the grid, effectively. We've put in some, you know, some small um, a substation, et cetera, that we needed to connect onto the national grid, but it's very reliable. We've had, in the whole you know, five and a bit years that we've been operating there, we've had minimal outages. We have got some generators as backup facility if we need them. Uh, but it's reliable, it's low cost. Railway infrastructure, you saw it on the video there, we've built a connection into the main railway. And I think one thing that is very good about Kazakhstan, it's well served on infrastructure needs, railway, power, water and everything else really. So I think we're well served in that regard. Okay, thank you. Mm. Okay, Nigel, thank you very much indeed, thank you.